evening and welcome to Sarmaya Talks. It's good to see you all. Thank you for, you know, braving the traffic and spending your Saturday evening with us. Um, to give you a little introduction to Sarmaya, Sarmaya is a digital museum with a physical archive in Mumbai with a really diverse and rich collection of art and historical artifacts. And our mission is to make art and history from the Indian subcontinent accessible to all in immersive, engaging ways. And Sarmaya Talks today is an extension of that belief where we wanted to create a space for conversations around art, culture, and history. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the evening, Rajashi Sengupta. Rajashi is a practitioner and art historian, currently teaching fine arts at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kanpur. He's recently contributed to the book, Cloth That Changed the World, The Art and Fashion of Indian Chins, and exhibited his most recent textile works in a group exhibition titled Crafting the Crossroad in Hyderabad. He's currently also working on an edited book on Deccani material culture. Please join me in welcoming Rajeshri. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you very much uh, for, first of all, thank you very much, Sarmaya, for having me here as part of this. This is a wonderful audience at the same time, a great platform. And I'm really happy to be uh, sharing some of my experiences and you know, just, just looking forward to have discussions afterwards. So thank you very much, Sarmaya. Also, thanks very much to all of you for being here for support. Thank you. So um, today, as you see, that uh, my presentation is titled Kalamkari Through Census on the Bodily Practice and Temporality of Textile Making. So Kalamkari, I believe that a lot of us, we know about it, that, that this, this famed dyed, painted, and printed textiles, and we get them everywhere. I mean, of course, that um, the specialized one we get. So what is it about? And then I have few of these uh, terms that I have flagged in this title that is, um, first of all, like Kalamkari through census. What does Kalamkari have to do with census? And then also about the bodily practice and temporality. What do I mean by all of those things? So I'll just, um, I'll just start with this visual, I guess, that I mean, uh, so, you know, as we just see it. So, um, so as we see that, I mean, once we start looking at Kalamkari, and of course that, I mean, there are overwhelming visuals that we find there. So if we see the visual description, we find that there are uh, depiction of flora and fauna, human beings, animal beings, and then like, of course, the rock formation and vegetal motifs and everything, all possible kind of narrative motifs we can think of. And those were featured in the Kalamkari hangings. And I'll come to the region and everything, but just to start with the visuals that what kind of textiles I'm talking about. Now, if we also see this, that there are many kind of colors which are there, but not too many pigments or not too many uh, dye stuff were actually used, but it was mostly kind of overlapping. Also the tonal gradation, which were employed for making the complexity in these textiles. So this is something I'm talking about, that imagine this as a painting, and then imagine this that is done on a cotton fabric that can be washed, that can be used. So that, that actually takes our uh, idea of like Kalamkari in a very different way. That I mean, it is not a painting to be hung on the wall, but it is something to be used, something meant to be washed and used repeatedly. So um, uh, as, as I just, uh, you know, as, as I just go on with the uh, presentation, I'll also like slowly hand over some of this, uh, uh, the small samples that I have. So the first sample, I'll just hand it over. And uh, this is a very simple uh, drawing, Kalamkari drawing, and um, I'll come to the I'll come to the um, you know the making of it. But just to hand them over, maybe one by one, and you are most welcome to see it, touch it, and everything the way the Kalamkaris are meant to be. So. If this is what we see that uh, this is the visual complexity that I start my discussion with, then imagine the, uh, the detail or this frame that we have on screen is actually not an entire piece, but this is just a small fragment of the piece that we have in the left side of the screen. So this is just a fragment from, I don't know if you can see like this area at 
the, at the bottom of the tree, the, uh, this, this land formation there, this plateau-like land. So this is just a detail from this entire piece. So this, these are usually called palampur or bedspreads. And then uh, uh, as you can see that, I mean, how uh, this, this, um, these details have been featured as part of this larger uh, Kalamkari piece. So this is also something that we need to um, see how Kalamkari had uh, evolved over time. But also at the same time, there have been a number of uh, different uh, artisans whose endeavors made them possible. So when we talk about Kalamkari, we see that Kalamkari is not just there that, is, uh, that indicates hand-painted uh, textiles, the one we see in the left side of the screen, but also the printed textiles. And there comes a confusion that why Kalamkari stands for both. If we do a uh, literal translation, kalam stands for pen or a reed-like instrument with has a sharp tip. Then like, I mean, then what does this printed fabric has to do with kalam? I'll come to that discussion again for, um, I mean, as, as the talk progresses. And then uh, we see that both this kind of this, uh, the block printed ones as well as the painted kalamkaris are uh, there in the, in the part of this region we'll be talking about. Now, when we say kalamkari, there are this uh, dye painted, resist dyed, printed, and all different kind of uh, this, this uh, complex dyeing technique that we can think about, all are collaborated. So when we think in terms of the craft specialization, mostly in South Asia, we think about a particular kind of skill that is emphasized. But when we think about Kalamkari, we see that there are different kinds of craft skills and all of those come together in making these highly complex textiles. And perhaps that is something that has fascinated a lot of us to study them and know them further. So to uh, get into the details of which are the regions that, that produces this, so the first of all, that is the, the coastal Coromandel region. And uh, in the right side of the um, screen, I have a map. And it just shows like, I mean, few areas on the map. As you can see that we have the coastal Coromandel region there and then the Bay of Bengal. And towards, uh, towards the, um, um, if, we, if we think about the Coromandel region, and usually the way we see the northern Coromandel and southern Coromandel, so uh, thinking about like some of the major rivers that flow through this coastline, starting with Godavari, and then uh, Krishna, and then uh, apparently, and, and then at the end, Kaveri. So in the, bay, uh, in the Godavari basin, and also like towards the uh, Godavari Delta, we have this site called uh, Palakolu, which you used to be an active site of producing kalamkaris. And then we have, like, as we move slightly towards the uh, south, then that is the area um, um, towards the, towards the uh, upper um, part of the image on right, and that, that shows Machlipatnam. That was one of the most important port towns as well as, like, most important uh, kalamkari producing area uh, that, that we have uh, there. And that is situated very close to the delta of River Krishna. And as we, again, like, I mean, move further south, we have, um, you know, of course, Pulikat Lake is very well known near Chennai. And then, uh, so Pulikat used to be one of the very uh, uh, well-known Kalamkari producing area as well. And towards slightly in the inland, um, there's this very uh, well-known uh, uh, pilgrimage site of Sri Kala Hasti. And there we have the river Swarnamukhi. And that place, used, um, that, that place was very well-known for producing temple hangings, which, were, uh, which are predominantly uh, um, hand-painted and not printed. And then we also like, I mean, as we move further, we also find that there are multiple sites in the Kaveri Delta as well, which used to produce Kalamkari fabrics. So there is something to do with the coastline that we find there and why this coastline has been such an important part of making these textiles. So one thing we can definitely think about is the, is the weather. The, the condition of the water, what kind of water we get, and also in terms of like what all dye stuff we get, and then also the kind of skill set the artisans might have had.
So with this ones, if we think about the production part of how Kalamkari textiles have uh, flourished in this area, and at least from 16th century, we have the tangible evidence, and we believe that it had been continuing for, um, you know, it, it, it was there before, but at least the tangible evidences are there from 16th century onward. So if that is the production part we are thinking in terms of what was uh, responsible for uh, the, the, the growth and sustainment of Kalamkari making. The other very important part would be the patronage. And without patronage, no craft can survive. So for that, we have this, this very strategic location of the Coromandel Coast, which has been um, um, you know, very... Uh, active in terms of the trade connections, at least for the two millennia or maybe more. And so what we have here that during this, uh, um, you know, during this early modern period, the same, uh, the, the time frame I'm talking about from 16th century or so on, we have this extensive global connections that we find that uh, the, the traders from uh, southern, uh, southeastern China, from Southeast Asia, from the Middle East, and eventually from Western Europe, they will start arriving there, both towards the Malabar coast as well as the Coromandel coast. Now in Malabar coast, we do not have this kind of specialized textile making. However, in Coromandel coast, the patronage, the availability of the local water, dye stuff, and the artisans, everything uh, were, were um, in, in this uh, synthesis for which this textile making had um, um, you know, thrived. So uh, that, that, that is just to say that, I mean, I wanted to show this image in the left side to show what all different kind of trade connections I'm talking about. And of course, this is a scanned image from a book. And this, this also comes from an exhibition that took place in 2013 at the Metropolitan Museum of Art that said interwoven globe to think about the textiles in a, in a global perspective and not just to think in terms of the, the regional specificities. But of course, I mean, I'll be spoken focusing more on the regional specificities, but I did want to acknowledge that as well. Now coming back to the textiles, that what are we looking at and what is there to be studied or like why we need to pay more attention towards it. So this is a kanath or a tent panel that is there and it has five vertical panels the way it stands today in the National Museum of New Delhi. And, uh, and we believe that it was actually part of a larger um, uh, tent hanging and only this fragment is now surviving. Some of the people have also commented on how a similar uh, tent hanging is there with the Victoria and Albert Museum. Some people believe that the larger hanging was actually cut in pieces. One one piece was eventually ended up in the National Museum, and the other one, of course, w was there with the VNA for a long period of time. Now, so if we see that what all is happening in the visual, so in the central panel, I'll just uh, have your attention there. In the central panel, we'll see this dynamic bird, this two-headed bird, which has this dragon-like uh, um, um, you know, face, and at the same time, if you see, like, I mean, the way it is, like, shown upside down, and it has this really uh, interesting, um, the feathers and the body parts, really, in a lyrical fashion, it has been shown. And then the birds, I mean, if you see the face of it, the dragon-like face, it, it does not end there. There are, like, two elephants, which it holds in its beak. So the elephants are actually peaked off, because the elephants, I don't know, I cannot really show the cursor. Maybe I can just point it here. So there are two elephants here. And these areas are black because uh, black dye was used there. there. There were two elephants here. And you can see like this area is empty because black dye was used there. And black dye is an iron-based black dye that we have in the Coromandel Coast, which sort of like, I mean, you know, uh, it eats up the textile over time. And we are looking at a 17th century piece. So that's the reason the black area is now removed. But if we go with this iconography, that there is this two-headed bird, which is really dynamic, flying downwards. It holds two elephants in its beak. Then we have its uh, very close resemblance with the image of Gandabirunda. 
and Gandabirunda is the uh, um, you know uh, is believed as a as a form of Lord Vishnu, and mostly in in the region in in Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, and Karnataka, and of course that I mean the Mysore uh, you know the royal insignia also uh, um, you know adapted the image of Gandabirunda. We still see that in the uh, you know the the Bangalore bus tickets and the the police and everyone they still use that insignia there with this two-headed bird. Now, if the two-headed bird is there, as a, as a uh, of course, like, I mean, if you think about the iconography of Lord Vishnu, and Lord Vishnu is also considered as a, as a um, of course, as an icon of stability, then why is it turned upside down, which is definitely not making it stable, but dynamic? Now, also, if we see the, um, the details of this bird, then we see that there are, uh, um, of course, like the face of it, it has this um, unmistakable Chinese characteristic. At the same time, the feathers, the way like the lines, the swelling lines, those fly all over in this panel. So they have this very Chinese as well as like, I mean, um, the, the Eastern Asian influence there. So, if, so what is happening? So is it like, I mean, one thing we can connect to or like if there are multiple things which are going on at the same time? Now, adding to the complexity, I want to also introduce some of the other images. So in the left side, we have this, uh, um, this, this pendant in which this is, this, this is definitely, it's a, um, um, you know, it's a um, 20th century uh, pendant that we see from, uh, I believe it was from Karnataka, <clears throat> but it is just written in uh, South India in the National Museum collection. There you can see how the double-headed bird or Gandavirunda has been shown here. And then of course that this is, this is not really upside down. This is a very stable way of showing the motif. And then in the right side, I wanted also to show this uh, gravestone from uh, Walandapalem. So that means Walandapalem basically means it's a Dutch neighborhood in, in the port town of Machlipatnam. And this also comes from 17th century in which you can see here is again this double-headed bird motif. So the thing is that, I mean, we see that certain motifs that we find in this early modern Kalamkaris and this kind of exercises that continued later on as well, with these motifs do not really have one particular source of starting, but they were uh, looking at many different kind of sources. And that is what it make them dynamic, that is what that make them inconclusive, and also for us to be always fascinated about. So, this, this kind of this double-headed bird in this, uh, in this uh, gravestone that we find, those are uh, usually found in the Dutch heraldic symbols. So uh, you can imagine that, I mean, uh, if Mashli Patnam is the place from where this gravestone is found, and of course, like, I mean, this entire graveyard is now being taken over by ASI and we all can visit there. So, if this is the Dutch connection we are talking about in 17th century, at the same time, in the 17th century, we also have the belief about Lord Vishnu's form as Gandhavirunda, and then also how the, uh, this, this Chinese uh, motif of like either the, the dragon you can think of, also like, I mean, the phoenix motif, like, I mean, the flying phoenix motifs, they come very close to the way this dynamic bird has been shown. So we cannot really have just one way to look at it, but there needs to be multiple ways of looking at it at the same time, multiple ways to perceive them. Adding to that, we also have more stuff. So, and this is, this is perhaps that, that is the more well-known part, and that is to think about the connection between the murals and the textiles. So uh, in the right side, I have this one, just a fragment, from this large, um, um, you know, t again, a tent hanging, and that, that comes from Calico Museum in Ahmedabad. And um, here in the left side, I have just a fragment of the murals from this fantastic Veeravadra Swami temple in Lepakshi, southern Andhra Pradesh. So you can see that there always have been this connection between what is there in the painted forms of the murals and then something there on the textiles. So if we think about the connections, it's not really an easy one to make because the murals are there in a permanent place and then it is immobile. At the same time, like the textiles are something that needs to be handled by many artisans. It just like, I mean, being handed from the washer people to the people who would probably do the drawing 
then the dying, and it continues. So the, the transition is something, and um, this, this uh, movement is something that is embedded into this, and then the murals are something that is absolutely different from that on the, on the surface level. So we see that, I mean, even after that, there are many uh, ways in which we can still make the connections. And some of the, some of the people have definitely uh, commented on how, uh, uh, of course, the, the depiction of the textiles have been very important part in this uh, Vijayanagara murals, and especially in Lepakshi, that this, this fantastic range of patterns that we find in these textiles almost are there for us to learn from them and reproduce them in the textiles. Textiles. So I really wonder if these murals were just painted for uh, depiction of the life or it was also painted as a repository for the future learners to learn from them and create from that. So these are the kind of like aspects we can find from Kalamkari and one thing is, you know, how one thing leads us to another. And if we think about the, if the architecture and the textile connection in the murals, that how the depiction of the textiles are very prominently featured in the murals, then the architectural references in the textiles are also unmistakable. And first of all, these are made as tent hangings, so that those will be these mobile architectural forms and architecture on the move, basically. And then if we see the, all the architectural details, those have been there. So there are many details we can find from the, uh, uh, you know, from the Deccan Sultanates, from like, I mean, from Golconda, from Bijapur, and, and the arches, the simple arches, unlike the cast Mughal arches and everything. So the, the very characteristic ones we find there. But also at the same time, we also find the Kakatiya pillars with the Hamsa motifs and all the other details there. So it's overlapped everything together. We cannot, again, the way we were talking about the other textile in the earlier slide, we cannot really put a finger and say that this is exactly where it started. We do not know where it started. All these things are, um, you know, much more sort of complex than what we see. So if this is what it is, then and all these things we are talking about right now are about seeing the textiles, then what happens, we start perceiving them perhaps more than just seeing, but also to see them, smell them, touch them, and, and get involved with them, to perceive them. So for, from there, I just uh, want to sort of uh, flag a few of the uh, details that uh, our, our discussion started with, that in the, in the um, left side, I have a painted Kalamkari, and I should not say painted, it's just drawn Kalamkari, and the, that is that is something that is uh, well known in the um, you know in the Sri Kalahasti area, as I have already mentioned. And then we have the um, of course we, we we have the other one that is the block printed kalamkaris. Those are those are now being done in the Mashripatnam area uh, on the on the coast. So. These are both ways in which we find that as we were talking about the, the murals and the textile connections, there are also tremendous amount of um, uh, connection between what is being painted with hand and what has been carved on the wood and then printed onto the textiles. So a lot is happening between them. So this definitely, these are not disconnected. And what are the connections we can think of? So the first thing I just focus on here is the word kalam, because as um, you know, at the beginning, I just raised this question that what is kalamkari? If kalam means pen or a reed or like, I mean, a, a, a writing tool with a sharp uh, edge or a tip, then what does that have to do with block printing? So this is something that, that I had been um, always fascinated about, and the, the term Kalamkari, at least some of the early mentions of it, I find in the Mughal Wakais from 17th century, some of them which were written in the, in the Golconda region after, um, um, you know, after, after Aurangzeb had taken over the Golconda kingdom. So this, this word 
comes at least from the 17th century and still it remained almost uh, unresolved that, I mean, why the printed ones are also called Kalamkari. Now, during the, uh, during, during my field work, so um, the, the master block makers who are based in Pedana, near Mashli Patnam, um, uh, Gangadhar Kondra and, and Narsaya Kondra, among many other block makers, so they have suggested that uh, there are also tools they use. And, and the tools that I, I'm talking about are uh, this ones. So these are basically just hand-drawn images of the engraving tools they have. These are very small iron-made tools. And those are uh, with, the, with the sharp edges, of course, like, I mean, you know, they, they hold the tool with the non-dominant hand. If someone is a right-handed person, they have to hold the tool with the left hand and then beat it with the wooden um, beater. And that is how, like, the images are created on the wooden block. And very interestingly, these sharp objects they call kalam. So as you can see that, I mean, this idea of kalam is not really there just restricted to pen, but something that has a sharp a tip and that can actually create the images which are linear. Something similar to, as we can see in the uh, left side of the screen, in which we have a regular column in which there is this bamboo uh, holder, and at the, at the tip we have this bulbous, very characteristic kalamkari tip in which cotton and fabric is sort of wrapped, and then uh, threads are sort of um, you know, used for uh, tying them uh, tightly. So what, what happens after this, that when you have this tool in your hand, you dip it in the dye solution, solution or in the modern solution and slowly squeeze this bulbous grip and then the dye or the modern comes out and that is how you draw on the fabric. Now for drawing on the fabric you cannot really use, I mean well like some people do use brush but you do not really get the linear effect the way the kalamkaris are done because um, brush does not really have that kind of grip that you can have on paper. We are talking about textiles, right? So these are, these are some of the ways in which we, when we engage with the artisanal communities, we find that there are many more ways in which we can see even the simplest of the terms. We can have more understanding about why uh, both painted and printed these fabrics, these dyed fabrics are called kalamkaris. To get more into this, I also want to, uh, you know, get into the details of this coastal landscape that I was talking about. And here on screen we have images from, uh, mostly from Pedana, from Polavaram, uh, so those, those areas are around the Krishna Delta in the Mashlipatnam area. And uh, here we have this abundant of the water resources and, and uh, this, this water resource is something that, that I had been uh, talking about that, that they, they are crucial for making these textiles. And also interestingly, these this areas are also agriculturally rich. So polavaram basically means, uh, polalu is, uh, you know, it's the paddy field and the field which are, which are prosperous. And so polavaram basically means it's a place where uh, the paddy and everything, those, those grow. So it's kind of like, I mean, there are the agricultural activities and the agricultural activity also support the dyeing activities because for, um, for, for um, you know, boiling the fabric and everything, they need a particular kind of fuel which would burn for a long time without the, uh, you know, without uh, the, the, the temperature to be checked periodically because the, the rice husk is perfect for that per particular purpose. So these are the kind of areas in which we find how the coastal landscape, the ecology, the other practices that we have around them are helpful for the growth of this textile making. The other thing is there that is, uh, you know, the, the Sri Kalahasti region. And uh, here I have images of this very well, uh, well, I mean, not, not both of them are very well known. One is very well known, that is uh, Jornalagadda uh, Gurapachetigaru. So he uh, recently uh, passed away, but uh, so he is seen in um, here. And this is uh, um, Aitur Munikrishnan, and so uh, he, he 
both of them they they started their career and uh, e even though like i mean aithur munikrishnan did fantastic works especially this sai baba hanging that that i studied which looks like a comic strip with speech bubbles and everything but he never really got his due recognition so anyways and this is a, a, it's a very well known uh, kalamkari hanging this 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 is uh, this shows jesus christ in um, of course in this this very well known temple hanging setup at the center where we see the figure of christ and then he is enshrined and all the other narratives are sort of uh, following in this horizontal uh, um, uh, freeze like format in the in this in this uh, fabric so this this is again it's a commissioned work and just wanted to give you a sense of uh, what kind of textiles again we are talking about when we are um, uh, you know talking about the contemporary hand drawn kalamkari textiles so um, to to ju also just to give a brief about what happened so during the colonial period we definitely see that there was a decline and and uh, only uh, few people were left who do the um, the this hand drawn kalamkari as at the same time like i mean the block printed kalamkari and after the independence uh, with with the with the setting up of the all india handicrafts board aihb in 1952 we see that kamla devi chattopadhyay and pupul jaikar were at the forefront of promoting this this uh, craft practices and and um, of course that they have traveled to various places including shri kala hasti and and will will come to mostly patnam as well and they have set up some of these training centers training center training and demonstration centers one was set up very close to the town of shri kala hasti and we see these two figures there and this this photograph actually was there with muni krishnan garu and and now it is there with obbu padma who who um, you know who who was a caregiver of muni krishnan garu so uh, this was perhaps there in the uh, in this this training center that 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 uh, was set up by the AIHB and uh, it functioned until 1980s and after that things sort of like i mean went in a different way so in mashri patnam area as well we have that i mean some of the uh, early records that we have after independence would be the 1961 census in which we see that this this extensive craft documentation take place and and um, um, of course we see the this is the mashri patnam town area and some of the areas which we see here like rustambada and then um, uh, the saipeta and all so those those areas were well known for uh, uh, dyeing but also just to talk about the town of mashri patnam there are places like uh, english palem that means is the settlement of the english people then the valanda palem so valanda is the word that is used for the dutch right so like i mean so uh, so like th those those kind of neighborhoods we still see there in the town of i mean otherwise sleepy town of mashri patnam but it's fascinating that place so and uh, here we have the this uh, prolific figure uh, vinakota venkata swami naidu and he was one of the practitioners of natural dyeing kalamkari in the 1950s when the team from delhi reached there and they found um, you know he what he was doing there and eventually like i mean you know the the, the artisans that um, i have interacted with the master artisans somewhere or other they benefited from this person so some people they got the blocks from him some people uh, benefited by like i mean you know uh, how how he shared his knowledge of dyeing and printing with them so that that is that is how uh, uh, we find that i mean he was a very important figure for uh, sustainment of the kalamkari printing in the mashri patnam area now after this i'll also like to just uh, give a brief about how this printing is done and uh, so here as we see that uh, there are um, the you know it's it's from the preparation stage to uh, like it this just shows like i mean few of the things about the preparation and uh, instead of like i mean showing the finished textiles i wanted to focus on the preparation because that is the part we usually miss out on but that is very important so uh, the the fabrics and the one that i just handed over as well so they need to be washed very carefully at the beginning to get rid of every all all possible kind of impurities and uh, when when i say impurity that means like dirt and or um, like any kind of greasy content which which resists the dye from penetrating into the fabric and then 
it needs to be treated with myroballin. And myroballin is something that is also there, uh, found in abundant in, in uh, most of the warmer parts of South Asia. And, and so when it is uh, treated with myroballin, myroballin is usually tannin rich. So that, that allows the dye to penetrate in the fabric better. And so after the myrobalan treatment, we find that there are also like repeated, um, um, of course, like, I mean, washing and cleaning that takes place at, at every stage. Like, I mean, if after the myrobalan treatment, they're washed and then the first layer of printing with black or with the first layer of modern would be done and then it is washed again, then the next layer of modern would be uh, there. Now, in the right side of the screen, I also wanted to show the image of uh, Mukanti Garu. Uh, so he, he is the late master dyer Mukanti Varadurao, and this photograph actually I took only few months before his death. Um, uh, and here we see um, his, his son, Nageshwara Rao Garu. And, and um, Nageshwara Rao is, is now running the, their, their workshop. So their workshop actually got a lot of the, um, um, the printing blocks from uh, Vinnakota Venkateswami Naidu. At the same time, he learned a bit from him as well, Mukanti Ishvaradu Rao and, and his father. So uh, they are the ones I, I mostly interacted with during my field work, and, and of course there are others, but I mean, uh, they, they have been very helpful for uh, understanding that why there is a need for uh, looking at this Kalamkari textiles or perhaps perceiving them. So uh, to, to illustrate that little further, I just want to flag another issue, and that is to do with this red dye in Kalamkari making. And red dye that is uh, obtained from this, um, almost this mythical, uh, this, this uh, dye stuff called chaya roots, chaya vere, or like, um, uh, you know, th th there are few terms for it, but uh, people, people, and it, it started from the colonial documents, and then it was also sort of uh, um, emphasized in, the, in, in some of the recent um, textile uh, history works, art historical works as well, that I mean that is solely responsible for obtaining this brilliant red dye in the Coromandel textiles. But when we actually go to uh, meet the, um, um, you know, the, the artisans, we actually see there is a different thing that is going on there. So this is, uh, uh, this is part of this documentation of the chaya roots. As you can see, this is a shrub-like, uh, this, is, this is just a plant. And then the root, this is the one. And this is the one from which this alizarin uh, heavy, con uh, you know, like, I mean, the content is uh, ex extracted and that is used for uh, dyeing. Now this this one also grew abundantly in the in the coastal region, and here we see that how the chaya roots were. Um, and th okay, so this this botanical drawing, as you see, that that comes in uh, 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 Roxborough, William Roxborough's book, that is the plants of the coast of Coromandel, which was published in 1795. And then subsequently we find that I mean how the uh, the colonial government that they thought that I mean uh, exporting of the chaya root would be beneficial, economically beneficial. And that is how the dried chaya roots, we find that to be like, I mean, stored and sent to different museums. So some of them we find in the Indian museum collections, like this comes from the Botanical Survey of India in the Kolkata office. And then we, of course, we have the other ones in London and few other places. So there was this stress on the chaya roots. But then, like recently, some of the um, the textile scholars and practitioners they tried using chaya roots, and the same chaya roots they have used, for example, uh, textile histo um, textile historian dye specialist B. C. Cecil was using it, and then um, uh, the members of the Sutra Textile Studies in Kolkata they used it, and then uh, dye specialist Jagadha Rajappa from Hyderabad she used it, and all of them they found that the chaya roots do not produce the kind of red that that is, that is uh, you know, the, the Coromandel textiles are well known about. Now, when I moved and when I asked, uh, um, you know, the, the dyers, mostly uh, Mukanti Ishwaradu Rao Garu and then Nageshwara Garu and then few of the other people like Pichuka Srinivas and all. So they said that, uh, yes, the dye is important, but more importantly, the water is there. And um, then Nageshwara Garu, he, he mentioned this very interesting saying in Telugu there, and that is called like Ikkara Alajana Vere Gaundi, which basically means like uh, um, the, the, the thought process 
is different here, but what he meant was like here the water makes you think differently. And the thing is that, I mean, if we think about it, that we already started talking about this very uh, characteristic coastal water resources where we have both the salt water and sweet water. And the dyers know very well how to make use of the salt and sweet water. And, um, and for, for certain particular dye preparation, you need salt water. For particular dye preparation, you need to like control the, um, you know, the, the, the salt content in the water. And even like, I mean, for, uh, for during the monsoon, they have said that how in the monsoon there is more water than the, the salt, usual salt content in the, in the sea water. So they add salt to it to make it favorable for their dye preparations. So these things, I believe that, I mean, that sort of makes our uh, understanding of Kalamkari textiles, um, you know, um, different from just focusing on the dye stuff, but looking at the things which are much more intangible, something that we cannot really see on the textile, that this is not the dye stuff, but the water. The water is very much part of the making, but once the textile is made, there is no trace of the water. But it's, it's very much like the artisanal hand itself, right? Like, I mean, the artisanal hand is very much part of the making, but once it is made, then there is no trace of it then these are, these are some of the ways in which we need to sort of consider that why uh, thinking about these textiles or to thinking them through our senses is more important than just to see them. And this is, um, it's a, um, it's a um, you know, these are, these are all um, samples which I found in the Weaver Service Center, Chainet Abhavan in, in Hyderabad, and it just shows that the range of colors you obtain from this basic dye material and they did not really go uh, with the experimental ones, but just the basic ones. And just to show that, I mean, what all dyes can be obtained with the simple mordant, and, and of course, like, I mean, with interchanging the dye stuff that we have. And um, also just to, uh, since we are talking about the printed ones, I also want to just hand out the, um, this, um, you know, these samples here, and they come from uh, Suraya Hassan's, uh, um, you know, House of Kalamkari and Dharis. So Suraya Hassan, Suraya Appa uh, has been, um, have, had been a very important uh, textile um, activist at the same time. Also, uh, he, he, she reconstructed Himru and Mushru textiles in the, in the Deccan region of, of uh, southern India. So uh, in, in the, in, she, she also was instrumental for um, when, when I began my research. And, and um, so she, she also mentioned that if you want to study these textiles, you definitely need to understand the, the weather condition in the coast. And and, and I, when she said that, she just like, I mean, said that just like this. But it took me a long time to understand what she meant by like, I mean, to understand the weather condition in the coast or like the condition of the water there to understand that what all goes on, what we cannot really see in the textile, but how that, those are integral for making them. Now, the other issue that is part of it is that how, um, some of the, the printed motifs, as you can also see in these samples that we have here, those are repeated. So the repetitive motifs that we have on the printed Kalamkari textiles, and that is something we find that how that is, uh, um, um, you know, related to, uh, um, of course, that, I mean, how, how those, those are related to, uh, um, you know, making the running fabric. However, if we see that, that I mean, from the artisanal perspective, we find that those are also uh, part of like how knowledge is uh, generated because repetition is a process that, that also like that, that, that is done over time. And that is the way, like, I mean, when we do the same thing again and again, it is not really a boring process, but it is a process through which knowledge is generated, sustained, and if you need to modify that, alter that, transform that, all those things happen through that. And here, um, there are just some, uh, you know, trace drawings. And uh, so one of the requests I got from um, the, the block makers, Kondra Gangadhar and Kondra uh, Narsaya was to, you know, to, to have some of their trace drawings as a printed booklet. And I have a printed booklet here, which was, which was made possible by a grant in 2018. So just wanted to show this. And these are the 
transitions as you can see that how from making the block and then like the images are printed. Now only one thing I did there and that is to have like all these images that you see here, these are from the contemporary workshops from um, Kondra Gangadhar and Kondra Narsaya until here and this is actually an image from Victoria and Albert Museum. So this is an image from 18th century, but you see that, I mean, if you think about it, that how the making is important part of it, then we can also see the historic objects. They are always in conversation with the contemporary practices. So that is how the temporality comes in handy. And just to conclude that, I mean, how this, this uh, uh, practices have been um, useful for me or, um, educational for me. So these are some of the works that I did and um, I displayed recently. So I'd say that the works have uh, this, this visual works which follow the same way of doing Kalamkari um, on, on, on the fabric that, that I have studied. And uh, so developing the color at the same time like developing these fabrics. So it had run simultaneously with the, uh, um, with the research. And um, so some of the things, for example, that I mean, this uh, doing this very mundane activity of uh, drying the fabrics on the ground, something that I could not really write in the research that uh, how, how deeply I felt for that. So I guess like the visual works actually made space for that. So I was kind of look, doing this, this exercises here and overlapping them with the more well-known images of the ambassadors and maps and everything. And also like in terms of how the, the, the format of these textiles. For example, this one as we see on the wall, but this is actually a floor spread which can be approached from this side because you see the figures are upside down and also approached from this side because here we see the figures um, you know, on this, on this um, um, scale. So these are, these are some of the things that made me sort of um, um, also experiment with uh, the format and, and uh, content of them. And more than the narrative content, it is about the viewer's experience, also that the way we think about viewing or sensing them. And so, yeah, so this is, just the textiles and this was a display that uh, just uh, it happened over the summer and I wanted to have these textiles the way I studied them either in form of canopy or on the uh, horizontal plane and definitely not on the wall. So these are some of the things that I mean I study from this textile and wanted to I, and definitely I'm um, you know studying them further to explore them in my own works as well. Um, thank you very much. And uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, any questions? We have a couple of mics going around, so we're, we have some time for questions. Uh, so um, that was great. Thank you. Uh, my only question really is. This entire area that you are talking about, the Coromandel Coast, and you know what is currently happening there with this particular craft, because I understand it's that delta region which is, uh, you know, sort of the reason why it's proliferating there. But how does it uh, go forward? I mean, is it dying? Is it, you know, expanding? Where? Because we have some uh, work that's happening in the Polavaram area. I'm aware of that because organizationally we're doing something. But is, is there something that you can throw some more insights on that? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. So, uh, yes, of course, the, the issue is that, I mean, even though Palakolu, Nizam Patnam, and few of the other places on the coast, which used to be well known for textile production, and we do not really see any of the Kalamkari textile happening there uh, anymore. In the Palakolu region, we have this crochet work, but not Kalamkari. And the only region in the in the entire uh, coastal region that we see today, where the um, you know this this block printed kalamkari is thriving, that is the Maslipatnam area, the Polavaram, Pedana, and and Maslipatnam. And very interestingly, what happened was uh, if you uh, think about like the recent things that happened after 2010, uh, around that time there was a boom about the kalamkari textiles, and people started doing them on silk screen. 
and even when like I mean some of the earlier visits that I made to the block makers workshops and all so right beside the uh, Gangadhar Pondra's workshop this new silk screen unit came up and he thought that I mean he is threatened and you know not knowing that what to expect afterwards but then what happened was like I mean after a few years around like 2016 uh, this one dyer and printer, Pichuka Srinivas Rao, so he went and made a complaint to the district magistrate about the use of the silk screen printing, because, not because of anything else, not because of the trade and anything, but the residue that is generated from the silk screen, when those are deposited to the canals and the water channels, they, they, they just pollute everything. And the same canals are also used for feeding the agricultural field. So when this thing started off, then apparently when he made the complaint the next day, there were like some um, 50 or more people protesting right outside his house. <laughs> so he had to he had to handle that. But eventually, what happened was people also became aware of um, what is what is it to be more sustainable, and 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 then like I mean the the silk screen printed fabrics they sort of um, definitely were were. Um, um, discouraged by the way we also see the global trend in terms of slow fashion so now like recently this summer when i went when i went when they are almost after 2 years for this covid so i found that i mean on, only like 15 to 20% of those screen units are there what used to be in the past so i guess like i mean there are always these shifts so it's not really like a linear growth or a linear decline that we think about but it's always very dynamic Yeah, I, I wanted to know whether there was any um, documentation of the various plants that are used and whether these plants, because there are two streams, there's medicinal and then now, uh, and how permanent are these? If you, if you say it's washed often, how permanent is the color and does the pigment become faded, does it lose color? So as you can see, like some of these textiles, uh, this one at least, I can talk about it. This one comes from like 1640. So if the color is like this, you can imagine that, I mean, it can actually sustain. So of course, like, I mean, there, there, there are ways in which like, I mean, the low light and everything has been um, uh, sort of enabled for, for the, uh, you know, the longevity of these textiles. But also another thing that I just want to mention that I was just talking about it, that dye specialist Jagada Rajapa, who had also been very instrumental for my studies and everything else. So she always says that natural dyes have a lifespan like us, like human beings that we do not really stay the same for the entire time, but we do not really lose our beauty. Well, the reason I asked is I was there last week. Okay. The degradation is so sharp that, uh, you know, I was amazed that you had such an excellent photograph. Oh my God. The way it's kept in that temple is really sad. The photograph was taken, let me see, the, the date is there. Oh. It was taken in 2015. Okay. Oh my god. That I have to look into that. Oh, that, that is really disheartening then. Most interesting, uh, Shiram. This uh, Lepakshi temple in so many ways is a mother unit for so many art forms. You know, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the leather puppet guys, their entire, I mean a large part of their uh, inspiration comes from the uh, narratives on the walls of the Lepakshi. And now it's interesting to see Kalamkari also drawing from uh, Lepakshi format. So it's obviously it was something special about the temple where everyone seemed to go and then translate that into various art forms. Just an observation. It was believed to be in a crossroad of the trade routes. 
So of course that. Thank you so much. Subscribe to Sarmaya and be a part of the stories and conversations around art, history and culture.